All right, good morning, good morning. Hey, I wanna welcome those that are watching online, especially our Boston family and those that are watching all over the country today. One time, can we welcome in our online family today, church? Come on, come on like you mean it, like you mean it. We're glad that you're tuning in. Today we start a brand new series called Legacy and we have interwoven this into the rhythm of our year. Every year we take about one or two weeks to talk about the word legacy what that means for you and what that means for us as a church. And in the next two weeks, what my goal is, is I want to try to teach you how to live a life that is beyond your life, a life that continues to live on. Because the reality is, if you don't embrace who God made you to be, if you don't make a difference on this side of eternity. If you don't leave a legacy that points to Jesus, I'm telling you, you will never be fulfilled ever until you live a life of legacy and a life that really matters. I don't know about you, but some of you that are getting older, I know I'm getting older. The older I get, the more I'm approaching the day that I will pass from this life. And the older I get, the more I think about my legacy. The legacy that I want to leave for not even just my kids, but my grandkids and my great-grandkids, what is it that I want them to say about me? What's the legacy that I want to leave behind? I got a couple definitions of legacy for you, for those that are taking notes. Number one, legacy is what people remember once you're gone. These are the things that people are going to say at your funeral and beyond. You know people talk about you when you leave, right? <laughs> They're going to talk about you one way or another. And most of the time at the beginning, you know, at the funeral, they're not going to say anything bad about you. They're just not. You know, that's the time we're going to say something good. We're going to find something good to say about you. All right? But as it goes on, it's going to be like, yeah, I mean, you know, Grandpa, he was, he was a, a character. And, uh, you know, he was really like, you know, he was really tight with his money, and he was, you know, I mean, I think about the things that my grandpa, and I think about the things that I said about him at his funeral, and then I think about some of the things that, like, his character, and I think about his legacy, and I, he left a great legacy, but there are some quirks and twerks, you know, that we, we would talk about, and the, the reality is people are going to talk about you when you're gone, and my question to you is, what do you want them to say? What do you want them to say at your funeral, here's what I want my kids to say about me. And I have this down because you need to have a vision for your life. We have a vision for the church, but we don't need to just have a vision for the church and not a vision for our life and our family. And this is my vision. And this is what I want them to say about me at the funeral. So we need to record this and give it to them so they'll actually say it, you know. I want them to say, my dad laid down his life so that others could find theirs. That's what I want my legacy to be. I, I want to be somebody who just gives away everything. My time, my talent, my treasure. He, he gave away all of his time. He gave away, uh, in his giving, he just gave it all away. And my father laid down his life so that other people could find theirs. That's what I want my family to say about me. What do you want your family to say about you? I think it's important for us while we're still living to think about that because as we think about that moment when people will speak about us at our funeral, it actually helps us shape the way that we live today. Psalm 112, 5 and 6 says this, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely. So the people that just give away their time, their talent, their treasure, man, it's just like God gives it to them. It flows right through them. They're just, they're just givers, man. It says good will come to those who are generous and lend freely. So I'm not going to keep everything that God gives me. I'm going to give my life away so that it makes a difference. He goes on to say good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. And then he says this. This is a promise. This is a huge promise, especially in today's world when everything is chaotic, everything is shaking around us, especially the political climate. The racism, the, the gender, like it's, it's all, it's, the world's going crazy right now. It's cray-cray, like you can say that. It's all right. We're, 
But it says, surely the righteous, though, us as followers of Jesus, we will never be shaken. And they, us, those that are generous, will be remembered forever. You want to live a, a legacy life, you got to be a giver. You have to be generous. You say, is, it, is there a formula to leaving a legacy? Yes, there is. I just showed it to you. If you want to be remembered, and if you want to live a life that points to Jesus, then we must be generous. And, and the thing about being generous and just giving away your life, and you can fill in the gaps on what that means for you, time, talent, treasure. When you give your life to something that is bigger than this life, it doesn't take away your problems. It just gives you a focus that's bigger than your problems. And it makes your problems not feel so big anymore. It doesn't take away your problems like you're never going to have any problems. It's just now my life is all about Jesus. My life is all about giving my life away. And the problems don't seem as big, as potent. And so I want you to have a vision for your life. The other legacy definition is just simply this, where my life lives on. Did you know that there's actually a way that you can give that your investment actually shows up in heaven? Did you know that there's actually a way that you can give that your life continues to live on even when you pass from this life? Your legacy is intertwined in the next generation and they continue to live on. I brought a picture of a kid. I don't know if you recognize him or not. Some people are like, where did Merrick get the red hair? I think I had red hair at one time. I looked at this picture this week, and, and you know, I thought, man, like, well, how old am I there? Two, right, three? And then I started thinking about the church that my family attended when I was that age. And then I started thinking about the generous givers that gave to that church. I had nothing to give, right? but they had everything to give. And we grew up at an excellent church in Winston-Salem called Pinedale Christian Church. And I think about some of these men and women who have gone on to be with Jesus, and yet they gave faithfully. And it's because of their giving that I'm here today, that our church even exists. And their legacy is li being lived out through me, through us, is powerful. Literally, when you give, you're giving to the next generation, and your legacy can live on through others. So I want to tell you, when you live your life, give your life to something that's going to outlive you, that's going to continue to live even after you're gone. But Because the goal in life is not to live forever. Come on, everybody's going to die. Welcome to church. The goal is to leave something that does. So nobody lives forever. But you can give your, of your life in a way that it leaves something that does. So every year, we come to this moment in the year where I give you an opportunity, and I give me an opportunity, and it's us an opportunity as a family to give above and beyond our regular giving in seven weeks. So in seven weeks, we're going to take up our yearly, above and beyond our regular giving, legacy offering. And you can mark down the date. It's December 11th, 2022. And I'm just asking you to begin to pray and ask God. Begin to have conversations with your spouse. Begin to have conversations with your family. I, I don't like high emotion, spontaneous manipulation, guilt-driven giving. I, I just, that's never been my heart. What I like to do is prepare our hearts, and in seven weeks, we're gonna come together as a church family, and we're gonna give together as each part does its work. And I'm not gonna tell you what to give. That's between you and the Lord. And I want you to have a conversation with God that just looks like this. Hey, God, you've done so much for me. You've given me an awesome church family where my family is fed. 
and it's not perfect, and I'm not claiming it to be perfect, but I'm just asking you, would you just, in seven weeks, would you just lay a number on my heart and press upon my heart a number that you would want me to give, that you would have me to give? You simply do that. Just ask God, and you give that. You say, well, where does this offering go to? It actually goes to our four legacy lanes. So this is kind of a family talk today. If this is your first time here, just know this is kind of a family talk. We're not asking you to give anything. This isn't a country club where you got to pay your dues to be a part of it. I promise. This is for those that say, hey, Rescue House is my home. This is what you give to. The first legacy lane is our campuses and, and, and our campus here. And, and we've done a, a ton of upgrades uh, this year. So because you gave, we were able to do uh, the lighting uh, we restored the lighting in here. It was super dark at the beginning of the year. And so we really wanted people to bring their physical Bibles, be able to read, uh, follow along, take notes, things of that nature. And we were able to do that in here. We were able to update our wall. At the beginning of the year, this was just a white block wall back here. But we were able to invest in an LED wall for our online family for you to increase our experience here and help really put the Word of God on display at a higher level. Um, we were able to put window tinting on our windows. We were able to upgrade our atrium lighting. I mean, there, we are a family, and in a family, we live in a house, and we got to take care of the house, and we got to take care of God's house, and that takes resources, and it takes money. One of the things that we, we want to do next, because as you can see, we are upgrading our, our wall here in the auditorium and on the other side of the atrium, um, and, and we're doing that because you, you faithfully give. The next thing that we really want to do is we want to invest in our, our, our next generation and in our youth. And we have like a small drawing. It's not like a rendering, but I want to put this up uh, for you. And this is going to go in the back wing back here. So some of you don't go that, some of you volunteers do. You come in through the back. Um, but through those doors right there, we want to create a dream team headquarters, which is going to be where our volunteers can put their stuff, where they can hang out. It's going to uh, be a multi-purpose room as well for meetings and counseling meetings and things of that nature. So it's not just on Sunday. It's going to be used all throughout the week. And then the thing that we're really excited about that we want to do is we want to uh, give our next generation, our 6th through 12th grade, we want to give them their own space because right now they set up, tear down everything. And so we want to give them a youth room, a place where they can come after school and do their homework if they want to, a place where they can hang out, a place on Wednesday nights where they can have small group. We, want, we really want to invest in a youth room for our next generation. But that takes resources. It takes money. And so that's a lot of where um, we want to put our legacy offering if we can. The next uh, legacy lane is our families. So we are a family-oriented church. We believe in marriages. We believe in men's ministry, women's ministry. Uh, we believe in counseling for the marriage and counseling for the families. We believe in parenting, equip seminars. Uh, we believe in helping the family with financial freedom. And so really, we get to come beside many families every single year, like, like families that are on the brink of divorce, and we get to counsel them, and we get to keep marriages together. When you give, you keep marriages together, families together, children intact with their mother and their father. You get to help families experience financial freedom. It's very, very powerful. And so we invest in the family here. The third legacy lane is our next generation ministries. This is our kids' house ministry and our rise up ministry. Kids' house is birth through fifth grade. Rise up ministry is sixth grade through 12th grade. And we do believe in the next generation. I'm telling you, we don't have a student ministry or a next generation ministry. We are a next generation ministry. Like, we believe in the next generation. We have to be a church that invests in them, that passes the baton of the church to them, and we have to do that really, really well. I'm telling you, a church that has no young people in it is a dying church. It just is. These are our future pastors. These are our future leaders. This is the future of the church. And so we want to invest in them. And our vision behind that is we want to help them discover who God made them to be. But we do that through the verse Luke 2, 52. 
Do you guys know what this verse is? We get one verse between Jesus being a boy and him being 30 years old. We get one verse, and it's Luke 2, 52, and it's Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and favor with man. And so we want our next generation of students and kids to grow just like Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, in favor with man. So how did Jesus grow? He grew in wisdom. He grew in intellect. So we want to help our next generation ministries grow in intellect and God's word. So he grew in wisdom and in stature. That's physically. It could also do and mean as purpose, as they grow in their purpose. So they grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God. So they become know, to know more about God and to know him intimately and develop a relationship with him and favor with Man, that's relationally with people. So we, want, we have a strategic plan to grow our students and to grow our next generation ministries the same way that Jesus grew into an adult. We do that through our new curriculum that we just uh, purchased months ago. The thing is about, you want to be honest about the, the curriculum? The curriculum is $9,000 a year. A year. And, and like you say, well, what? that's a lot of money to invest. Like, why don't you just like come up with something? Because we want to give our next generation ministries the best of the best. And we want them to grow like Jesus grew. And we believe it's worth $9,000 a year to come alongside of them and help them with that. But it takes resources. It takes all of us coming together to invest. And the last legacy lane is missions. Local, national, and global. Local is our strategic partners around here. So when we first started Rescue House Church, we didn't want to, you know, pioneer a clothing closet. We didn't want to pioneer, you know, a food pantry or, you know, helping the needy with their eyes or their, their ears. Like we, we just, we didn't want to pioneer that. What we wanted to do was partner with organizations that do that really, really well and send them money and send them resources and volunteer hours and come beside of them. So we didn't want to pioneer. We wanted to partner. And we, so we give away 10% of every dime that comes into Rescue House. So we're already strategically thinking about how do we help the families in Florida who just experienced that hurricane. We don't have to take up a special offering. We don't have to play on manipulation and emotion and say, hey, we give to that. No, we already set aside 10% of every dime that comes in that goes to outreach, that goes to missions, and we give. So you've already given to help the people in Florida. You've already given to help people in our community who don't have a resource to, to get food or clothing because we come beside those organizations and we give them massive checks. And we give them hours. And so we give away 10% of every dime. Uh, uh, last year, we gave over $120,000 away to the community. Like you gave that. Like you, and, and, and this year, we've given to Celebrate Recovery. We, we've given to uh, City Lights Ministry. We've given to Storehouse for Jesus. We've given to Davy Pregnancy Care. We gave to the YMCA Initiative for backpacks for school for underprivileged children. Like, we, we are a giving church, and I want to pastor a generous church. We're not going to hoard everything that comes in. We're, we want to give as much of it as away as we can. And so I'm ecstatic about what God is doing here at our church, through our campus, the upgrades that we're seeing through our families and the marriages are, that are being restored. And I know you don't get to see all that, but I do. And it's, it's very powerful. I love that our next generation ministries are growing like Jesus grew. And that our, our missions, man, we're, we're going out. I'm hoping that we'll send a team down to Florida here in a couple weeks if that becomes available. And so I don't know about you, but I'm excited to give this year. And I'm not giving out of obligation. I'm not giving out of guilt. You know, most people end up giving just because they feel like they have to. Some people pray because they feel like they have to or they're supposed to. That's not how God designed it. God actually designed it in a way that you would be willing, that you would have a zeal and a passion to say, 
Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. And so I'm going to give to that. I'm going to give at the very chance that I have. Philippians 2.13 says this, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. In other words, he, so, so if you're in here and you're like, man, I, I wish I had that passion. I wish I had that zeal to like to give. But I just, if I'm just being honest, Pastor, if I'm being vulnerable, like I'm not really that excited to like give my money and give my time and give my treasure. I'm just, I'm just not. But here it says that God is working in you. And, and if you allow God to work in you, it says he's working in you to give you the desire and the power to do what pleases God him and so your will can be changed and I want to lead you to a place of having a desire and a power to do what God what pleases God Exodus 35 21 says this then everyone came whose hearts were stirred and that's what I want to do I just want to stir your heart today and everyone whose spirit was willing and they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of the meeting so I want to stir your heart to where you are willing. That's the one thing I've been praying for all week. I don't care how much you give. I don't care if it's like a $10 bill. I don't care if it's $100,000. I just, I want behind the gift to be a willing heart. I'll share with you the single greatest offering ever taken up, secular, spiritual. I mean, even secular people will say this is the greatest, the highest, the biggest offering ever taken up. And this was King David leading the charge in this particular offering in the Old Testament and was for the church, was for the tabernacle. See, they had been meeting in tents as it was set up and then they would tear it down then they would move it and set it up and tear it down. Anybody remember that? Winston-Salem, some of you, you know, you would set it up, tear it down. Well, that's how the church originated and it was called the tabernacle and it would move in tents. And David said, we've been doing this for a while. It's time for us to be like a permanent Place. And we see this in 1 Chronicles 29, starting in verse 3. It says, moreover, because I set my affection on the house of my God. And that's what I want to ask you to do. Would you set your affection toward the house of God? He says, I have given to the house of my God over and above that I have prepared for the holy house. In other words, he's saying, I'm going above and beyond what I regularly give. I'm, we're, this, we're making this home permanent, and we're going to give to the house above and beyond. And then he said this, he starts to stir the hearts of the people. He says, "Who then, who else is willing?" Everybody say willing. That's what God wants from you today, a willing heart, not just with your money, with your time, your effort, your energy. He says, "Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord?" And then others began to get excited, verse 6 and 7. It says, "Then the leaders of families, the officers of the tribe of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds and the officials in charge of the king's work, here it is, gave willingly. Everybody say willingly. They gave for the work of the temple of God. Verse 9, the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David, the king, also rejoiced greatly. Verse 17, all these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen the joy, how willingly your people who are here have given to you. This is the type of church that I want to lead. And I, I, I got to go first. Leaders go first. I want to lead a willing church, not a greedy church. Not a church with clenched fists. I want to lead a church that says, hey, we're going to give it away. We recognize this ain't even our home. This is a temporary space and place for me. I'm going to a, a, an eternal life in heaven, and I want to make an investment, and I want to give in such a way that my investment shows up in heaven. And the reason that the willingness is probably the most important part is because God is looking for that. Check out what 2 Corinthians 8, 12 says. It says, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. If 
It's acceptable. I'm trying to stir your heart today. Don't misconstrue my words, and please don't paint me as some you know, prosperity preacher that's trying to get in your wallet and get in your bank account. That's the furthest from my mind and my heart. I want to stir in your heart to be a generous person. Whether you give a dime to this church or not, I don't care. The Lord's pockets are deep. He's taken care of us all these years, even when we had nothing. If you don't give, the Lord is gonna take care of us. We still have the word of God, and as long as we have the word of God, we'll be fine. So it's not about your money. It's not about your bank account. It's not about your wallet. It's about your heart, and it's about stirring you to be to live a legacy life, and to be who God made you to be, and that is a giver. Again, you might be saying, man, I just I don't know. I'm just not feeling it. It's hard for me to feel it, to, to, to give above and beyond. I already give. Like Now you're asking me to give above and beyond, and how do I get there? And I think you get there in your desire when you remember your why. And I have to do that from time to time. Like, why did I even get into this in the first place. One, because God called me, right? So I have to remember that he's charged and commissioned me. He's, he's called me. Why, why do you come to this church? You have to remember your why. Why do you give to the Lord? Because when you lose your why, that's when you lose your way. That's why so many marriages fall apart. That's why so many marriages fall out of love is because they forget the why. They, they forget the feeling, and they forget how they worked in the beginning towards that marriage. But I'm gonna tell you, men, when you take your wife out, you know, after 25 years, and you take her and you set her down at a restaurant, and you say, hey, I just want you to know that all those years ago, like, I remember why I chose you, because you're the finest thing on earth, and the way that you love the Lord, and the way that you, you shepherd our children and instill God's word into them, I just want you to know why I love you, because you are a woman of God, and you make me a better man. I'm telling you, when you take, it's a good night at the Hudson House when I do that, okay? By the way, just letting you know. But sometimes you got to remember, you got to remember your why, amen? And it's the same way with church, it's the same way in any relationship. And I don't want you to lose your way in this church because you lost your why. Jesus always had his why on the forefront of his mind. This is Luke 4, 42 and 43. It says, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. In other words, they were trying to dictate what he was going to do. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also. And then he says this, because that is why I was sent. He never lost sight of his why, why he was here. And so maybe if you need a help today, like, getting a desire to be a part of God's house and to play your part. You need to get a why or you need to remember your why. And so I thought I would just close this sermon today just sharing with you my whys. Because I would never ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do. For, for 13 years, we've tithed faithfully to this church. We give above and beyond I mean, we, Lauren and I, we are givers. We are going, we, I would never ask you to do something I'm not willing to do. And there are preachers out there that will do that. They will say, it's your job to give. I don't roll that way. And so here's why I give to Rescue House Church. Number one, because Jesus gave to me first. That's right. Man, nothing fires me up more than, I were, than remembering where I was when Jesus first saved me. And, and the fact that he, when I look at like what he did for me and how he left heaven and he gave up, you know, dreams and do, do whatever he wanted to do, right? He gave up his body. He gave up his family. Also that a guy named Matt could experience eternal life. I'll never forget that day when he took all my shame away 
He took all my guilt away, and he put a purpose inside of me. And you know what? I'm just going to be honest. I love Jesus so much, he could tell me to do anything, and I'll do it. I don't care what it is. You just tell me to do it, and I'm, I'm in. I'm, you impress it upon my heart, I'm in. You tell me to do it in your word, I'm in. I just I love him so much for what he's done in my life. Anybody glad for what Jesus has done for you? Because he did it for you too. Matthew 10, 8 says, freely you have received, freely give. So as you have received, you allow that blessing to flow through you and you freely give. You got to remind yourself of what Jesus has done for you. The same verse in the paraphrase of the message says it like this. You have been treated generously, so live generously. Come on, live generously. We've got these cards out in the atrium. It says something, on the card, it just says something special to let you know that God is thinking about you. I really want to encourage you this holiday season to grab one of those cards in the atrium. It's just a little business card. And at some point in the holiday season, Leave a $50 tip, leave a $100 tip, and put that card with it, and let somebody know that God is thinking about them. Freely give. Or maybe you just want to bless somebody. Take one of those cards. Just do one. Or you can do more, but at least do one. Freely give. John Bonnell, he said this, if one first gives to the Lord, all other giving is easy. Number two, I give because it's more blessed to give than to receive. I think about the people in my family that are givers, and the person in my family that is just the most generous person with every aspect of his life is my father-in-law, Lauren's dad. He's the most generous person I've ever met, and I don't think I could, I just don't think anybody could top it. I mean, he literally will give you his whole wallet. He, he will, if we all went to church, or if we all went to Miller's today after uh, service, he's paying for everybody, the whole church. Now, he's gonna be in trouble with his wife, but I'm telling you, he's, that's just how he is. You, you're not allowed to pay for anything. Like, he takes care of it. And it's not like he has millions. Of, he's just a generous person. He'll buy washing machines for people. He'll, you know, take people meals. Like, he just, he just, lives his life in such a way that he just gives it all away. It's, it's so inspiring to me. Like, I want to be like my father-in-law. It's just, it's pow- when, he, when he comes to Rescue House Church, he gets, comes down here a couple times a year, he wears his Rescue House Church, and he doesn't even ask if he can be on the greeter team. He just gets out there and starts greeting people like it's his church. This is like, that's just the type of personality he is. He's just like, I'm going to serve. I'm going to give. I'm going to give my life away. Every aspect of where I am, like, I'm going to give my life away. On the other hand, I've got a family member and family members, and maybe you have some of them, that they're just takers. Don't they just make you mad? Like, you don't want to be a taker. But you don't. Like, you don't want to be, come on, anybody got a taker in your family? You know what I'm saying? You don't have, you know, you know, we don't, don't look at them, you know. <laughs> this is not the time to, like, turn your head, okay? <laughs> but I've got some, like, takers in my family. I mean, they just, they just show up. They, t- they don't contribute nothing, and they just lay in bed all day. They just do whatever they want. <laughs> you know why we call these our little suckers? Because they will suck you dry, dude. Like, they take, I mean, they take every bit of time. They take every bit of your money. And then you start thinking, like, I mean, this is how I was. Like, we kind of, our kids were on formula coming up. And so, man, formula was, like, so expensive. And we, like, getting them on formula and, like, diapers and stuff. And then we got, like, daycare. And we're thinking, man, when we get them out of daycare, get them off formula, we are getting a raise, people. And then they start eating whole pizzas. And then we start having to buy all their athletic equipment. And it's just like, these people don't get any cheaper, okay? 
I remember I was, I was at a race one time and I was registering for the race and there was this nice guy up there and I was talking to him. I was like, man, I just, he was trying to get me to buy something extra or whatever and I was like, nah, dude, I'm in baby jail right now. I got three kids under six and it's just like, man, I just ain't got no money. He was like, well, it's better, better than being in college debt, you know, baby jail. You know, he was like in the, co- you know, he had debt up to his eyeballs, you know, from sending all his kids to college and I gave me a perspective. I was like, oh, like, I'm going to, I'm grateful for baby jail right now. Like, <laughs> how many parents we got some college debt? You know, you're like, it costs a lot of money, right, to send your kids to college. And so I'm like, man, like, can I just keep diapers on these kids or what? Like, but they, you know, we got givers and we got takers. And listen, you do not want to be a taker. You don't want that to be your legacy. You want to be a giver. Some of you in here, you are a giver. You're like one of those people, it's like you're walking down the street and you see a lemonade stand with, you know, two elementary school girls who worked hard to do lemonade and you just like, you're just going to give them five, ten dollars and do it. You don't even like the lemonade as soon as they're out. You just throw it out because you don't really want lemonade. But like God put that in your heart to be a generous person. Acts 20, 35, the message paraphrase says this. You'll not likely go wrong here if you keep remembering what the master said. You're far happier giving than getting. You're far happier when you just give your life away than those who take and hoard. You don't want to be that way. Number three, reason why I give to rescue houses is because I'm in covenant with God and I'm in covenant with you. I made a pledge to to God and to this church that I was going to be in relationship with you and we were going to do this together. And listen to me, that's how God works is in relationship and brings people together. And as each part does its work, like we learned in the book of Ephesians, then the church becomes unstoppable. But the enemy wants to tear down those relationships. He wants to divide the church. He wants to divide our relationships because we are not very potent. We are not very powerful, separated, and divided. That's why Jesus said, a house that is divided cannot stand. And so together, when we give and each part does its work, people's lives are changed. Lauren and I moved back here in 2009 to start this church. We lived in a glorified dorm room. We didn't get paid hardly anything. Lauren didn't have a job for the first year. We trusted God. Along the way, we were $45,000 in debt as a couple, and my marriage was on the rocks. I've told you about this before. The first six months of my marriage was, we got off to a bad start. It wasn't like honeymoon stage, and we just like, pew, like right out the gate. And there was one decision that I made when, when God said, you know, I, I prayed one time. I mean, I'll have to tell you the story. Like, Lauren uh, left for about 24 hours. And I, and I got on my knees, and I just prayed to God, and I just said, God, I just pray that she didn't go back home to Philadelphia. I pray, God, that you would bring her back to me, and like, and I'll figure this out. And I just remember him pressing upon my heart, and he said, what he said, he said, it's your job to fix this. It's your job to fix this. And I said, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. And I remember her, God brought her back. And, uh, and we talked, and we talked about how I had been like, uh, we looked at our financials, we looked at how I was starting this church, but I hadn't given to the church. I was asking other people to give, and, and we made this, we looked, and a lot of it was about money, and a lot of it was, you know, we looked at it, and we made a decision together to tithe for the first time, because I didn't grow up in a church that taught me to tithe and to give. And I'm going to tell you what, that one decision to put us Underneath the provision of God, it saved my marriage, saved our church. That was the day that I became a generous person because I almost lost my wife because I was stingy and clenched fist. And we decided we were going to be planted in the house. Psalm 92 says this, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. And that's our story. We tried to do it without him. We were Christians, but we tried to do it without his provision. 
when you're planted in the house of the Lord, you're going to flourish. When you're a giver, you're going to flourish. Because none of us are as good as all of us. It takes all of us together in the house of the Lord. When you do that, lives are changed. Number four, the reason I give is because I really believe in the vision of my church. Ephesians 3.10 says this, through Christians like yourselves gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. And I just want you to know the, the local church is the hope of the world. We're a giving church. and We make a difference. It's Jesus through it. We give him all the glory. It's not about us. It's only about the name of Jesus. But we have a video of somebody that is a part of our church that we get to give to, and we just want to share this story with you. So turn and check out this video. God's given me a lot of really cool roles. He's made me into a husband, um, a son, a brother, a nephew, a grandchild. But one of my really cool roles and, and calling that God's given me is being a teacher. Um, I know it's not by accident that I've ended up in the teaching field. Since discovering my purpose of not just being a teacher, but truly working with you, it's been amazing to feel the support from Rescue House. First, just, I'll never forget when Jesse called me. I was actually at school, it was during planning, and giving me the opportunity to work with youth. And I could immediately feel like it was God calling. It wasn't by accident. I had actually told Jesse when she called me, I was like, it's so crazy. I was like, I've just been praying about this. Um, you know, just feeling like God's calling me somewhere, and then, and then she called. So that was a really cool first step, was just her reaching out and letting me get involved with the church and with our youth. And for that whole year, just learning what youth ministry looks like, how it works, what small groups look like. But what's really cool is last year, um, we opened a brand new middle school. First year, and so getting to start a youth ministry at a brand new school, it was powerful to watch God work. And it was powerful to watch him work through our church. It's amazing how much support is at Rescue House. I never reached out, asked for anything, and Jesse called me and Julie were like, hey, you know, we really want to help you get this ministry started. And getting funds just to get us off the ground. I mean, it was able to give us snacks after school, notebooks for journaling, for prayer journals. We were able to get Bibles um, for when we were having after school meeting. It's just the ultimate support that you get. First, being involved in church, and then outside, like helping me start a ministry at the middle school. It's, it's been awesome. I mean, being a teacher, I'm with kids all day, so I just can't emphasize enough, like, how much support for the youth means. To start pointing them to, like, who they are in Christ, letting them see that, it's all about the next generation. I mean, they are going to be our future leaders. Like, one day, there's going to be a student in my classroom, I'm fully confident, that's going to be in a pulpit. And how cool would it be if, if he's able to say, you know, the first time I ever experienced Jesus was at Louisville Middle School. Like, getting to come in to an after-school program before school and, like, hearing the name of Jesus for the first time. We can't see it right now, but I see the seeds being planted. <laughs> the next generation, they're our future, and they're, they are what are important. They are going to be our leaders. So the more that we can plug them in, show them who Jesus is, how much he loves them, and just get them on fire for it. Like, watching them spread the news to other students, it's so powerful. To anybody that has given to the legacy offering, I just want to say thank you. It's, it's a thing in the moment to where when you give, you're, you're praying and you're being faithful. And a lot of times you don't know exactly how it's going to be used. And what I can tell you is part of that legacy offering was used to start a ministry at a middle school. And the first meeting we had, you know, we had seven or eight, nine, and we kind of sprinkled. And the start of this year, our last meeting in the gym, we probably had at least 100 kids packing in that gym. I get to be a part of a church that wanted to be a part of our ministry.
gives me cold chills. Like, just thank you to Jesus and thank you for like allowing me to be a part of a church like this that truly <laughs> means what they say. Like when they tell us like we care about you, like we're there for you, they mean it a hundred percent. And I promise like these funds are powering this next generation. They're allowing us to do things, to take trips, to get resources for these kids, just to continue for them to learn who God made them to be. So Rescue House, I just, I can't say thank you enough, for real. Pretty cool. Matt Snow, he normally comes to our second experience as a, you know, and we get to invest in him as a leader in the community. He gets to discover who God made him to be. He gets to start a youth ministry in his school where he helps other students. Uh, that's just powerful, and it's your giving. And in that, we were able to give him another $1,000 to continue his ministry at that middle school. Come on, we need God in our public school system, and this is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna be a light. We, we, got, we as Christians, we gotta push back. We just can't let politics, we can't just let things overtake the school system and overtake our world. We gotta push back, and we gotta be generous, and it's time for the people of God to step up and, and to give willingly and to trust and believe that God can multiply our offering. But the number five reason why I give to this church, it might be a selfish one, but it's because I want to hear Jesus say, well done. I think that's the, one of the most important things that I, can, that I care about, that I want to prepare you for. You know, we talk a lot about this final exam that you're going to have, and you will have it. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Have you ever thought about it, like, or imagined it? And it's probably not right, but, you know, you can imagine what it's going to be like, like the day you see Jesus face to face. And, you know, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about in that moment, did I do enough? You know what I'm saying? Like, you're, you're going to be... You say, but, but the Bible also talks about there are rewards in heaven. That as you invest in the, and as you give your life away, that investment shows up in heaven and there are rewards that some will get that others will not. And there are rewards that you're gonna get to place at Jesus' feet. And I just wanna give my life away. And I, I don't know, I think about it like, Maybe I'm gonna be in like some holding cell or something and they're like, Matt Hudson to the front, please. You know, or I don't know. And I just imagine coming around the corner and, and just seeing him, you know? And they say there's like no tears in heaven, but I have no idea how I'm gonna make it through that. And I just want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you how many ever years and the way you invested your time, the, the way that the gifts that I deposited inside of you, the way you used your talent, the way you stewarded my resources that I gave to you and, and the money and well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom I have prepared for you. And I imagine I imagine him being just inside the doors. all the people you helped get there. And I just want to live my life in such a way that makes heaven more crowded. And I want you to, you don't have to be a pastor. I don't need you to be a pastor. I need you to be who God made you to be. 
but you've got to live a legacy life. And I'm going to close with this, and I'm not closing with this for some emotional manipulation. I just want to give you perspective. About a month ago, a lady by the name of Brittany Ellison gave her life to Jesus and was baptized in this church. And I baptized her, and, and just this past week, she passed away. And you gave to her life. You gave to her coming to know Jesus. She's in heaven with Jesus because there was a group of people who believed that there was more to this life than this life. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for giving. Thank you. Her life is eternally changed because of you. Because of what Jesus is doing through you. So in seven weeks, we have an opportunity as a church to give above and beyond. And man, I want to I challenge you to give big. I want to challenge you to give as God would lay it on your heart. Pray and ask God to stretch you. Would that be your prayer? God, stretch me. <laughs> Put a number on my heart that might make me uncomfortable. And you give exactly what he puts on your heart. And let's do this together in seven weeks. And let's watch God multiply it. And let's make heaven more crowded together. Are you with me? Come on, are you with me? So when you leave today, we're going to give you one of these keychains that say legacy on it. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, that you would put it on your keychain. From now, for the next seven weeks, and every time you look at this, it's a reminder to be praying for your number, for what God would have you give. So when you leave today, we should have people at the doors. Make sure you get one of these um, as you leave. Let me pray for you, and then Pastor Harry's going to come and share with you. Nobody moving around. Don't take off yet, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. God, I know this is a tough message to sit through sometimes here, but God, I pray that you would be honored by it. God, again, I pray for our hearts. God, I pray for our minds. I pray that we'd be open to what you would have for us. And God, I just pray that you would lead and guide us, that your Holy Spirit would come in our homes, in our houses, in our hearts, and lead us to the very place that we're of obedience to you. So impress upon all of our hearts and a number. And God, I pray that we would be obedient to that. God, we thank you for Jesus who makes all things possible, who lived for us, died for us, ascended for us, and who reigns and forgives us. We worship you today, Jesus. We magnify you. We lift your holy name up, God. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider partnering with us financially? You can do that simply through giving through the Rescue House app or making a donation online at our website. And you too can be a part of helping others discover who God made them to be. And if today's message impacted you, would you share it with a friend or a family member? And lastly, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you in person. So join us next Sunday at our Moxville campus location. Now, go be who God made you to be.